The Shepherdess and the Chimney Sweep by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Agnew. Have you ever seen a very, very old clothes press, quite black with age, on which all sorts of flourishes and foliage were carved? Just such a one stood in a certain room. It had been handed down as a legacy to the owner from a great-great-grandmother, and it was carved from top to bottom with roses and tulips. The most curious flourishes were to be seen on it, and between them little stags popped out their heads with zigzag antlers. But on the top a man at full length was carved. True, he was laughable to look at, for he showed his teeth laughing one could not call it, had goat's legs, little horns on his head, and a long beard. The children in the room always called him General Clothes Press Inspector Head Superintendent Goat Legs, for this was a name difficult to pronounce, and there are very few who get the title. But to cut him in wood was no trifle. However, there he was. He looked down upon the table and towards the mirror, for there a charming little porcelain shepherdess was standing. Her shoes were gilded, her gown was tastefully looped up with a red rose, and she had a golden hat and cloak. In short, she was most exquisite. Close by her stood a little chimney sweep, as black as coal, although he was made of porcelain too. He was just as clean and pretty as the rest of them. As to his being a chimney sweep, that was only what he represented, and the porcelain manufacturer could just as well have made a prince of him as a chimney sweep, if he had chosen. One was as easy as the other to a clever workman. There he stood, so prettily with his ladder, and with a little round face as fair and rosy as that of the shepherdess. In reality, this was a fault, for a little black he certainly ought to have been. Footnote. The flues in Germany are much larger than in the houses in England, so much so, indeed, that men only are employed as sweeps. The lower part being very wide, they have short ladders of about eight feet in length to enable them to get up the narrower part, where they then scramble on in the usual way. End of footnote. He was quite close to the shepherdess. Both stood where they had been placed, and as soon as they were put there they had mutually promised each other eternal fidelity, for they suited each other exactly. They were young, they were of the same porcelain, and both equally fragile. Close to them stood another figure three times as large as they were. It was an old Chinese that could nod his head. He was made of porcelain too and said that he was grandfather of the little shepherdess, but this he could not prove. He asserted, moreover, that he had authority over her, and that was the reason he had nodded his assent to the general clothes-press inspector head superintendent Goatlegs, who paid his address to the shepherdess. "'In him,' said the old Chinese, "'you will have a husband who, I verily believe, is of mahogany.' You will be Mrs. Goatlegs, the wife of General Clothes Press Inspector Head Superintendent, who has his shelves full of plate, besides what is hidden in secret drawers and recesses. I will not go into the dark cupboard, said the little shepherdess. I have heard say that he has eleven wives of porcelain in there already. Then you will be the twelfth, said the Chinese. Tonight, as soon as old clothes breath cracks, as sure as I am a Chinese, we will keep the wedding. And then he nodded his head and fell asleep. But the little shepherdess wept and looked at her beloved at the porcelain chimney sweep. I implore you, she said, fly hence with me into the wide world, for here it is impossible for us to remain. I will do all you ask, said the little chimney sweep. Let us instantly leave this place. I think my trade will enable me to support you. 
If we were only down from the table, she said, I shall not be happy till we are far from here and free. He consoled her, and showed her how she was to set her little foot on the carved border on the gilded foliage which twined around the leg of the table, brought his ladder to her assistance, and at last both were on the floor. But the, when they looked towards the old clothes-press they observed a great stir. All the carved stags stretched their heads out farther, raised their antlers, and turned round their heads. The general clothes-press inspector, head superintendent, gave a jump. Arid called to the old Chinese, They are running away! They are running away! At this she grew a little frightened, and jumped quickly over the ridge into a low drawer near the window. Here lay three or four packs of cards, which were not complete, and a little puppet-show, which was set up as well as it was possible to do. A play was being performed, and all the ladies, diamonds as well as hearts, clubs and spades, sat in the front row and fanned themselves with the tulips they held in their hands, while behind them stood all the knaves, ready to wait upon them when they wanted anything. The play was about two persons who could not have each other as they wished, at which the shepherdess wept, for it was her own history. "'I cannot bear it any longer,' said she. "'I must get out of the drawer.' But when she had got down to the floor and looked up to the table, she saw that the old Chinese was awake, and that his whole body was rocking. "'The old Chinese is coming!' cried the little shepherdess, and down she fell on her porcelain knee, so frightened was she. "'A thought has struck me,' said the chimney-sweep. "'Let us creep into that great potpourri jar that stands in the corner. There we can lie on roses and lavender, and if he comes after us, throw dust in his eyes.' "'Tis of no use,' said she. Besides, I know that the old Chinese and the potpourri jar were once betrothed, and when one has been on such terms, a little regard always lingers behind. No, for us there is nothing left but to wander forth into the wide world. Have you really courage to go forth with me into the wide world? asked the chimney sweep tenderly. Have you considered how large it is, and that we can never come back here again? I have thought of all that, said she, and the sweep gazed fixedly upon her, and then said, My way lies up the chimney. Have yon really courage to go with me through the stove, and to creep through all the flues? We shall then get into the main flue, after which I am not at a loss what to do. Up we mount, then so high that they can never reach us, and at the top is an opening that leads out into the world and he led her towards the door of the stove. "'It looks quite black,' she said, but still went with him, and on through all the intricacies of the interior and through the flues where a pitchy darkness reigned. "'We are now in the chimney,' said he, "'and behold, behold, above us is shining the loveliest star.' It was a real star in the sky that shone straight down upon them, as if to show the way. They climbed and they crept higher and higher. It was a frightful way, but he lifted her up, he held her, and showed her the best places on which to put her little porcelain feet, and thus they reached the top of the chimney and seated themselves on the edge of it, for they were tired, which is not to be wondered at. The heaven and all its stars were above them, and all the roofs of the town below them. They could see far around. They had such a splendid view of the world. The poor shepherdess had never pictured it to herself thus. She leaned her little head on her sweep and wept so bitterly that all the gilding of her girdle came off. "'Oh, this is too much,' said she. "'I cannot bear it. The world is too large. Oh, were I but again on the little table under the looking-glass, I shall never be happy till I am there again. I have followed you into the wide world. Now, if you really love me, you may follow me home again. And the chimney sweep spoke sensibly to her, spoke to her about the old Chinese and the general clothes press inspector head superintendent, 
but she sobbed so violently and kissed her little sweep so passionately that he was obliged to give way, although it was not right to do so. So now down they climbed again with great difficulty, crept through the flue and into the stove, where they listened behind the door to discover if anybody was in the room. It was quiet still. They peeked out, and there, on the floor, in the middle of the room, lay the old Chinese. He had fallen from the table in trying to follow the fugitives, and was broken in three pieces. His whole back was but a stump, and his head had rolled into a corner, while General Close Press Inspector Head Superintendent Goatlegs was standing where he ever stood, absorbed in thought. "'How dreadful!' said the little shepherdess. "'My old grandfather is dashed to pieces, and we are the cause. I never can survive the accident.' And she wrung her little hands in agony. "'He can easily be mended, only do not be so hasty. If they glue his back together and rivet his neck well, he will be as good as new, and will be able to say enough disagreeable things to us for some time to come. Do you think so? said she. And then they clambered up again to the table on which they had stood before. You see, said the sweep, we might have spared ourselves these disagreeables after all. If we had but mended my old grandfather, said the shepherdess, does it cost much? And mended he was. The family had his back glued and his neck riveted, so that he was as good as new, except that he could not nod. Meseems you have grown haughty since you were dashed to pieces, said General Close Press Inspector Head Superintendent Goatlegs. However, I think there is not so very much to be proud of. Am I to have her, or am I not? Then the chimney sweep and the little shepherdess looked so touchingly at the old Chinese. They were so afraid he would nod. But he could not, and it was disagreeable to him to tell a stranger that he constantly carried a rivet in his neck. So the little porcelain personages remained together. They blessed the old grandfather's rivet over and over again, and loved each other until they both fell to pieces. End of The Shepherdess and the Chimney Sweep by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Mary Agnew The Tale of Two Bad Mice by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time there was a very beautiful doll's house. It was red brick with white windows, and it had real muslin curtains, and a front door, and a chimney. It belonged to two dolls called Lucinda and Jane. At least it belonged to Lucinda, but she never ordered meals. Jane was the cook, but she never did any cooking, because the dinner had been bought ready-made in a box full of shavings. There were two red lobsters, and a ham, a fish, a pudding, and some pears and oranges. They would not come off the plates, but they were extremely beautiful. One morning Lucinda and Jane had gone out for a drive in the doll's perambulator. There was no one in the nursery, and it was very quiet. Presently there was a little scuffling, scratching noise in a corner near the fireplace, where there was a hole under the skirting board. Tom Thumb put out his head for a moment, and then popped it in again. Tom Thumb was a mouse. A minute afterwards, Huncha Muncha, his wife, put her head out too, and when she saw that there was no one in the nursery, she ventured out on the oilcloth under the coal box. The doll's house stood at the other side of the fireplace. Tom Thumb and Huncha Muncha went cautiously across the hearthrug. They pushed the front door. It was not fast. Tom Thumb and Huncha Muncha 
went upstairs and peeped into the dining-room. Then they squeaked with joy. Such a lovely dinner was laid out upon the table. There were tin spoons and lead knives and forks, and two dolly chairs, all so convenient. Tom Thumb set to work at once to carve the ham. It was a beautiful, shiny yellow streaked with red. The knife crumpled up and hurt him. He put his finger in his mouth. It is not boiled enough. It is hard. You have a try, Huncha Muncha. Huncha Muncha stood up in her chair and chopped at the ham with another lead knife. It is as hard as the hams at the cheesemongers, said Huncha Muncha. The ham broke off the plate with a jerk and rolled under the table. Let it alone, said Tom Thumb. Give me some fish, Huncha Muncha. Huncha Muncha tried every tin spoon in turn. The fish was glued to the dish. Then Tom Thumb lost his temper. He put the ham in the middle of the floor and hit it with the tongs and with a shovel. Bang, bang, smash, smash! The ham flew all into pieces, for underneath the shining paint it was made of nothing but plaster. Then there was no end to the rage and disappointment of Tom Thumb and Huncha Muncha. They broke up the pudding, the lobsters, the pears, and the oranges, as the fish would not come off the plate. They put it into the red-hot crinkly paper fire in the kitchen, but it would not burn either. Tom Thumb went up the kitchen chimney and looked out at the top. There was no soot. While Tom Thumb was up the chimney, Huncha Muncha had another disappointment. She found some tiny canisters upon the dresser labeled rice, coffee, sago, but when she turned them upside down there was nothing inside except red and blue beads. Then those two mice set to work to do all the mischief they could, especially Tom Thumb. He took Jane's clothes out of the chest of drawers in her bedroom, and he threw them out of the top-floor window. But Huncha Muncha had a frugal mind. After pulling half the feathers out of Lucinda's bolster, she remembered that she herself was in want of a feather bed. With Tom Thumb's assistance she carried the bolster downstairs and across the hearth-rug. It was difficult to squeeze the bolster into the mouse-hole, but they managed it somehow. Then Huncha Muncha went back and fetched a chair, a bookcase, a bird's cage, and several small odds and ends. The bookcase and the bird cage refused to go into the mouse hole. Huncha Muncha left them behind the coal box and went to fetch a cradle. Huncha Muncha was just returning with another chair when suddenly there was a noise of talking outside upon the landing. The mice rushed back to their hole, and the dolls came into the nursery. What a sight met the eyes of Jane and Lucinda! Lucinda sat upon the upset kitchen stove and stared, and Jane leant against the kitchen dresser and smiled, but neither of them made any remark. The bookcase and the birdcage were rescued from under the coal box, but Huncha Muncha had got the cradle and some of Lucinda's clothes. She also has some useful pots and pans and several other things. The little girl that the doll's house belonged to said, I will get a doll dressed like a policeman. But the nurse said, I will set a mouse trap. So that is the story of the two bad mice. But they were not so very, very naughty after all because Tom Thumb paid for everything he broke. He found a crooked sixpence under the hearth-rug, and upon Christmas Eve he and Huncha Muncha stuffed it into one of the stockings of Lucinda and Jane. And very early every morning, before anybody is awake, Huncha Muncha comes with her dustpan and her broom to sweep the dolly's house. The End End of the Tale of the Two Bad Mice by Beatrix Potter Read by Phil Chenevere Mangita and Larina from Philippine Folklore Stories by John Maurice Miller 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Manjita and Larina. This is a tale told in the Lake District of Luzon. At times of rain or in winter, the waters of the Laguna de Bay rise and detach from the banks a peculiar vegetation that resembles lettuce. These plants, which float for months down the Pasig River, gave rise, no doubt, to the story. Many years ago there lived on the banks of the Laguna de Bay a poor fisherman whose wife had died, leaving him two beautiful daughters named Mangita and Larina. Mangita had hair as black as night and a dark skin. She was as good as she was beautiful and was loved by all for her kindness. She helped her father mend the nets and make the torches to fish with at night, and her bright smile lit up the little Nippa house like a ray of sunshine. Lorena was fair and had long golden hair, of which she was very proud. She was different from her sister and never helped with the work, but spent the day combing her hair and catching butterflies. She would catch a pretty butterfly, cruelly stick a pin through it, and fasten it in her hair. Then she would go down to the lake to see her reflection in the clear water, and would laugh to see the poor butterfly struggling in pain. The people disliked her for her cruelty, but they loved Mangita very much. This made Larina jealous, and the more Mangita was loved, the more her sister thought evil of her. One day a poor old woman came to the Nippa house and begged for a little rice to put in her bowl. Mangita was mending a net, and Larina was combing her hair in the doorway. When Larina saw the old woman, she spoke mockingly to her, and gave her a push that made her fall and cut her head on a sharp rock. But Mangita sprang to help her, washed the blood away from her head, and filled her bowl with rice from the jar in the kitchen. The poor woman thanked her, and promised never to forget her kindness. But to her sister she spoke not a word. Larina did not care, however, but laughed at her and mocked her as she painfully made her way again down the road. When she had gone, Manchita took Larina to task for her cruel treatment of a stranger, but instead of doing any good, it only caused Larina to hate her sister all the more. Sometime afterwards, the poor fisherman died. He had gone to the big city down the river to sell his fish, and had been attacked with a terrible sickness that was raging there. The girls were now alone in the world. Manjita carved pretty shells and earned enough to buy food, but, though she begged Lorena to try to help, her sister would only idle away the time. The terrible sickness now swept everywhere, and poor Manchita, too, fell ill. She asked Lorena to nurse her, but the latter was jealous of her and would do nothing to ease her pain. Manjita grew worse and worse, but finally, when it seemed as if she would soon die, the door opened and the old woman to whom she had been so kind came into the room. She had a bag of seeds in her hand, and, taking one, she gave it to Manjita, who soon showed signs of being better, but was so weak that she could not give thanks. The old woman then gave the bag to Lorena, and told her to give a seed to her sister every hour until she returned. She then went away and left the girls alone. Lorena watched her sister, but did not give her a single seed. Instead, she hid them in her own long hair and paid no attention to Manchita's moans of pain. The poor girl's cries grew weaker and weaker, but not a seed would her cruel sister give her. In fact, Lorena was so jealous that she wished her sister to die. When at last the old woman returned, poor Manjita was at the point of death. The visitor bent over the sick girl and then asked her sister if she had given Manjita the seeds. Lorena showed her the empty bag and said she had given them as directed. The old woman searched the house, but of course could not find the seeds. 
She then asked Lorena again if she had given them to Mangita. Again the cruel girl said that she had done so. Suddenly the room was filled with a blinding light, and when Lorena could see once more, in place of the old woman stood a beautiful fairy holding the now well Mangita in her arms. She pointed to Lorena and said, I am the poor woman who asked for rice. I wish to know your hearts. You were cruel, and Mangita was kind, so she shall live with me in my island home in the lake. As for you, because you tried to do evil to your good sister, you shall sit at the bottom of the lake forever, combing out the seeds you have hidden in your hair. Then she clapped her hands, and a number of elves appeared and carried the struggling Lorena away. Come, said the fairy to Mangita, and she carried her to her beautiful home, where she lives in peace and happiness. As for Lorena, she sits at the bottom of the lake and combs her hair. As she combs a seed out, another comes in, and every seed that is combed out becomes a green plant that floats out of the lake and down the Pasig. And to this day, people can see them and know that Lorena is being punished for her wickedness. End of Mangita and Lorena by John Maurice Miller The Photographer and Philosopher by August Strindberg this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Photographer and Philosopher by August Strindberg. Once upon a time there was a photographer. He was a splendid photographer. He did profiles and full faces, three-quarter and full-length portraits. He could develop and fix tone and print them. He was the deuce of a fellow. But he was also discontented, for he was a philosopher, a great philosopher, and a discoverer. His theory was that the world was upside down. It was plainly proved by the plate in the developer. Everything that was on the right side of the original now appeared on the left. Everything that was dark became light. Light became shade. Blue turned into white and silver buttons looked as dark as iron. The world was upside down. He had a partner, quite an ordinary man, full of petty characteristics. For instance, he smoked cigars all day long. He never shut a door. He put his knife into his mouth instead of using his fork. He wore his hat in the room. He cleaned his nails in the studio, and in the evening he drank three glasses of beer. He was full of faults. The philosopher, on the other hand, was perfect, and therefore he nursed a resentment against his imperfect brother. He would have liked to dissolve the partnership, but he could not, because their business held them together, and because they were bound to remain in partnership. The resentment of the philosopher turned into an unreasonable hatred. It was dreadful. When the spring came, they decided to take a lodging in a summer resort, and the partner was dispatched to find one. He did find one, and one Saturday they departed together on a steamer. The philosopher sat all day long on deck and drank punch. He was a very stout man, and suffered from several things. His liver was out of order, and there was something wrong with his feet, perhaps rheumatism, or some similar disease. When they arrived, they crossed the bridge and went ashore. "'Is this the place?' asked the philosopher. A very little walk will take us there, answered the partner. They went along a footpath full of roots, and the path ended abruptly before a stile. They had to climb over it. Then the road became stony, and the philosopher complained of his feet, but he forgot all about his pains when they came to another stile. After that, all trace of the road disappeared. They walked on the bare rock through shrubs and bilberry bushes. Behind the third fence stood a bull, who chased the philosopher to the fourth stile, where he arrived in a bath of perspiration, which opened all the pores of his skin. When they had crossed the sixth stile, they could see the house. 
the philosopher went in and immediately stepped on to the veranda. Why are there so many trees? he asked. They interrupt the view. But they shelter the house from the strong sea breezes, answered the partner. And the place looks like a churchyard. Why, the house stands in the center of a pine wood. A very healthy spot, replied the partner. Then they wanted to go and bathe, but there was no proper bathing place in the philosophical sense of the word. There was nothing but the stony ground and mud. After they had bathed, the philosopher felt thirsty and wanted to drink a glass of water at the spring. It was of a reddish-brown color and had a peculiar, strong taste to it. It was no good. Nothing was any good. And meat was unobtainable. There was nothing to be had but fish. The philosopher grew gloomy and sat down under a pumpkin to deplore his fate. But there was no help for it. He had to stay, and his partner returned to town to look after the business during his friend's absence. Six weeks passed, and then the partner returned to his philosopher. He was met on the bridge by a slender youth with red cheeks and a sunburnt neck. It was the philosopher, rejuvenated and full of high spirits. He jumped over the six stiles and chased the bull. When they were sitting on the veranda, the partner said to him, You are looking very well. What sort of a time have you had? Oh, an excellent time, said the philosopher. The fences have taken off my fat. The stones have massaged my feet. The mud baths have cured me of my rheumatism. The plain food has cured my liver and the pine trees, my lungs, and, could you believe it, the brown spring water contained iron, just what I wanted. Well, you old philosopher, said the partner, don't you understand that from the negative you get a positive, where all the shade becomes light again? If you would only take such a positive picture of me and try to find out what faults I do not possess, you would not dislike me so much. Only think, I don't drink and therefore I am able to manage the business. I don't steal. I never talk evil of you behind your back. I never complain. I never make white appear black. I am never rude to the customers. I rise early in the morning. I clean my nails so as to keep the developer clean. I leave my hat on so that no hairs shall fall on the plates. I smoke so as to purify the air of poisonous gases. I keep the door ajar so as not to make a noise in the studio. I drink beer in the evening so as to escape the temptation of drinking whiskey. And I put the knife into my mouth because I am afraid of pricking myself with the fork. You really are a great philosopher, said the photographer. Henceforth we will be friends. Then we shall get on in life. End of Photographer and Philosopher by August Strindberg. For a Naughty Little Girl by Anne Taylor, read by Justin Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My sweet little girl should be cheerful and mild. She must not be fretful and cry. Oh, why is this passion? Remember, my child, God sees you who lives in the sky. That dear little face that I love so to kiss, how altered and sad it appears. Do you think I can love you so naughty as this, or kiss you all wetted with tears? Remember, though God is in heaven, my love, he sees you within and without, and always looks down from his glory above to notice what you are about. If I am not with you, or if it be dark, and nobody is in the way, his eye is as able your doings to mark in the night as it is in the day. Then dry up your tears and look smiling again, and never do things that are wrong, for I'm sure you must feel a terrible pain to be naughty and crying so long. We'll pray then that God may your passion forgive and teach you from evil to fly, and then you'll be happy as long as you live and happy whenever you die. End of For a Naughty Little Girl by Ann Taylor The Daisy by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
org. Now listen, in the country, close by the high road, stood a farmhouse. Perhaps you have passed by and seen it yourself. There was a little flower garden with painted wooden palings in front of it. Close by was a ditch. On its fresh green bank grew a little daisy. The sun shone as warmly and brightly upon it as on the magnificent garden flowers, and therefore it thrived well. One morning it had quite opened, and its little snow-white petals stood round the yellow center, like a ray of the sun. It did not mind that nobody saw it on the grass, and that it was a poor despised flower. On the contrary, it was quite happy, and turned towards the sun looking upward and listening to the song of the lark high up in the air. The little daisy was as happy as if the day had been a great holiday, but it was only Monday. All the children were at school, and while they were sitting in the forms and learning their lessons, it sat on its thin green stalk and learnt from the sun and from its surroundings how kind God is, and it rejoiced that the song of the little lark expressed so sweetly and distinctly its own feelings. With a sort of reverence, the daisy looked up to the bird that could fly and sing, but it did not feel envious. I can see and hear, it thought. The sun shines upon me, and the forest kisses me. How rich I am! In the garden close by grew many large and magnificent flowers, and, strange to say, the less fragrance they had, the haughtier and prouder they were. The peonies puffed themselves up in order to be larger than the roses, but size is not everything. The tulips had the finest colors, and they knew it well, too, for they were standing bolt upright like candles, that one might see them the better. In their pride, they did not see the little daisy, which looked over to them and thought, How rich and beautiful they are! I am sure the pretty bird will fly down and call upon them. Thank God that I stand so near, and can at least see all the splendor. And while the daisy was still thinking, the lark came flying down, crying, Tweet! But not to the peonies and the tulips, no, into the grass, to the poor daisy. Its joy was so great that it did not know what to think. The little bird hopped round it and sang, How beautifully soft the grass is, and what a lovely little flower with its golden heart and silver dress is growing over here. The yellow center in the daisy did indeed look like gold, while the petals shone as brightly as silver. How happy the daisy was! No one has the least idea. The bird kissed it with its beak, sang to it, and then rose again up to the blue sky. It was certainly more than a quarter of an hour before the daisy recovered its senses. Half ashamed, yet glad at heart, it looked over to the flowers in the garden, Surely they had witnessed its pleasure and the honor that had been done to it. They understood its joy. But the tulips stood more stiffly than ever. Their faces were pointed and red because they were vexed. The peonies were sulky. It was well that they could not speak. Otherwise they would have given the daisy a good lecture. The little flower could very well see that they were ill at ease and pitied them sincerely. Shortly after this, a girl came into the garden with a large, sharp knife. She went to the tulips and began cutting them off, one after another. Ugh, sighed the daisy. That is terrible. Now they are done for. The girl carried the tulips away. The daisy was glad that it was outside, and only a small flower. It felt very grateful. At sunset, it folded its petals and fell asleep, and dreamt all night of the sun and the little bird. On the following morning, when the flower once more stretched forth its tender petals like little arms toward the air and the light, the daisy recognized the bird's voice. But what it sang sounded so sad. Indeed, the poor bird had good reason to be sad, for it had been caught and put into a cage close by the open window. It sang of the happy days when it could merrily fly about, of fresh green corn in the fields, and of the time when it could soar almost up to the clouds. The poor lark was most unhappy as a prisoner in a cage. The little daisy would have liked so much to help it. But what could be done? Indeed, it was very difficult for such a small flower to find out. 
It entirely forgot how beautiful everything around it was, how warmly the sun was shining, and how splendidly wide its own petals were. It could only think of the poor captive bird, for which it could do nothing. Then two little boys came out of the garden. One of them had a large, sharp knife, like that which the little girl had cut the tulips. They came straight towards the little daisy, which could not understand what they wanted. Here is a fine piece of turf for the lark, said one of the boys, and began to cut out a square around the daisy, so that it remained in the center of the grass. Pluck the flower off, said the other boy, and the daisy trembled for fear, for to be pulled off meant death to it, and it wished so much to live, as it was to go with the square of turf into the poor captive lark's cage. No, let it stay, said the other boy. It looks so pretty. And so it stayed, and was brought into the lark's cage. The poor bird was lamenting its lost liberty, and beating its wings against the wires. And the little daisy could not speak or utter a consoling word, much as it would have liked to do so. So the forenoon passed. I have no water, said the captive lark. They have all gone out and forgotten to give me anything to drink. My throat is dry and burning. I feel as if I had fire and ice within me, and the air is so oppressive. Alas, I must die, and part with the warm sunshine, the fresh green meadows, and all the beauty that God has created. And it thrust its beak into the piece of grass to refresh itself a little. Then it noticed the little daisy, and nodded to it, and kissed it with its beak, and said, you must also fade in here, poor little flower. You and the piece of grass are all they have given me in exchange for the whole world which I enjoyed outside. Each little blade of grass shall be a green tree for me, each of your white petals a fragrant flower. Alas, you only remind me of what I have lost. I wish I could console the poor lark, thought the daisy. It could not move one of its leaves, but the fragrance of its delicate petals streamed forth, and was much stronger than such flowers usually have. The bird noticed it, although it was dying of thirst, and in its pain tore up the green blades of grass, but it did not touch the flower. The evening came, and nobody appeared to bring the poor bird a drop of water. It opened its beautiful wings and fluttered about in its anguish. A faint and mournful tweet, tweet, was all it could utter. Then it bent its little head towards the flower, and its heart broke for want and longing. The flower could not, as on the previous evening, fold up its petals and sleep. It dropped sorrowfully. The boys only came the next morning. When they saw the dead bird, they began to cry bitterly, dug a nice grave for it, and adorned it with flowers. The bird's body was placed in a pretty red box. They wished to bury it with royal honors. While it was alive and sang, they forgot it, and let it suffer want in the cage. Now they cried over it and covered it with flowers. The piece of turf with the little daisy in it was thrown out on the dusty highway. Nobody thought of the little flower which had felt so much for the bird and had so greatly desired to comfort it. End of The Daisy by Hans Christian Andersen, read by Kaylee. The New Baby by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A new little baby came down from the sky, came down from the sky in the night. A soft little baby with violet eyes, shining in pure and white. But how did the little new baby get down here from the depths of the sky? She couldn't have come alone, you know, for she's much too young to fly. Oh, the angels carried her down in her arms, from the far away beautiful blue. Brought her down from the arms of God, a present to me and to you. So, you see, we must kiss the baby, and give her a lot of love, that she may not need the angels till she meets them again above. End of the New Baby by Anonymous Fumati Rani or The Flower Lady by Anonymous Translated by Maeve Stokes This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There were once a Raja and a Rani, who had an only daughter called the Fulmati Rani, or the Pink Rose Queen. She was so beautiful that if she went into a very dark room, it was all lighted up by her beauty. On her head was the sun, on her hands moons, and her face was covered with stars. She had hair that reached to the ground, and it was made of pure gold. Every day after she had had her bath, her father and mother used to weigh her in a pair of scales. She only weighed one flower. She ate very, very little food. This made her father most unhappy, and he said, I cannot let my daughter marry anyone who weighs more than one flower. Now God loved this little girl dearly, so he went down under the ground to see if any of the fairy rajas was fit to be the Fumati Rani's husband. And he thought none of them good enough. So he went in the form of a fakir to see the great Indrasan Raja, who ruled over all the other fairy Rajas. This Raja was exceedingly beautiful. On his head was the sun, and on his hands moons, and on his face stars. God made him weigh very little. Then he said to the Raja, Come up with me, and we will go to the palace of the Fumati Rani. God had told the Raja that he was God and not a Fakir, for he loved the Indrasan Raja. Very well, said the Indrasan Raja. So they travelled on until they came to the Fumati Rani's palace. When they arrived there, they pitched a tent in her compound, and they used to walk about, and whenever they saw the Fumati Rani, they looked at her. One day they saw her having her hair combed. So God said to the Indrasan Raja, Get a horse, and ride where the Fumati Rani can see you. And if anyone asks you who you are, say, Oh, it's only a poor fakir, and I am his son. We have come to stay here a little while just to see the country. We will go away very soon. Well, he got a horse, and he rode about. And Fumati Rani, who was having her hair combed in the veranda, said, I am sure that must be some raja. Only see how beautiful he is. And she sent one of her servants to ask him who he was. So the servant said to the Indrasan Raja, Who are you? Why are you here? What do you want? Oh, it's only a poor fakir, and I am his son. We have just come here for a little while to see the country. We will go away very soon. So the servant returned to the Fumati Rani and told her what the Indrasan Raja had said. The Fumati Rani told her father about this. The next day, when the Fumati Rani and her father were standing in the veranda, God took a pair of scales and weighed the Indrasan Raja in them. His weight was only that of one flower. Oh, said the Raja when he saw that, here is the husband for the Fumati Rani. The next day, after the Fumati Rani had had her bath, her father took her and weighed her, and he also weighed the Indrasan Raja, and they were each the same weight. Each weighed one flower, although the Indrasan Raja was fat and the Fumati Rani thin. The next day they were married, and there was a grand wedding. God said he was too poor looking to appear. So he bought a quantity of elephants and camels and horses and cows and sheep and goats and made a procession and came to the wedding. Then he went back to heaven, but before he went he said to the Indrasan Raja, You must stay here one whole year, then go back to your father and to your kingdom. As long as you put flowers on your ears, no danger will come near you. This was in order that the fairies might know that he was a very great Raja, and not hurt him. All right, said the Indrasan Raja, and God went back to heaven. So the Indrasan Raja stayed for a whole year, 
Then he told the Raja, the Fulmati Rani's father, that he wished to go back to his own kingdom. All right, said the Raja, and he wanted to give him horses and camels and elephants, but the Indrasan Raja and the Fulmati Rani said they wanted nothing but a tent and a coolie. Well, they set out, but the Indrasan Raja forgot to put flowers on his ears, and after some days the Indrasan Raja was very, very tired. So he said, We will sit down under these big trees and rest a while. Our baggage will soon be here. It is only a little way behind. So they sat down, and the Raja said he felt so tired he must sleep. Very well, said the Rani. Lay your head in my lap and sleep. After a while a shoemaker's wife came by to get some water from the tank which was close to the spot where the Raja and Rani were resting. Now the shoemaker's wife was very black and ugly, and she had only one eye, and she was exceedingly wicked. The Rani was very thirsty, and she said to the woman, Please give me some water, I am so thirsty. If you want any, said the shoemaker's wife, come to the tank and get it yourself. But I cannot, said the Rani, for the Raja is sleeping in my lap. At last the poor Rani got so very, very thirsty, she said she must have some water. So laying the Raja's head very gently on the ground, she went to the tank. Then the wicked shoemaker's wife, instead of giving her to drink, gave her a push and sent the beautiful Rani into the water, where she was drowned. The shoemaker's wife then went back to the Raja, and taking his head on her knee, sat still until he woke. When the Raja woke, he was much frightened, and he said, This is not my wife. My wife was not black, and she had two eyes. The poor Raja felt very unhappy. He said, I am sure something has happened to my wife. He went to the tank, and he saw flowers floating on the water, and he caught them. And as he caught them, his own true wife stood before him. They travelled on until they came to a little house. The shoemaker's wife went with them. They went into the house and laid themselves down to sleep, and the Raja laid beside him the flowers he had found floating in the tank. The Rani's life was in the flowers. As soon as the Raja and Rani were asleep, the shoemaker's wife took the flowers, broke them into little bits, and burnt them. The Rani died immediately for the second time. Then the poor Raja, feeling very lonely and unhappy, travelled on to his kingdom, and the shoemaker's wife went after him. God brought the Fulmati Rani to life a second time, and led her to the Indrasan Raja's gardener. One day, as the Indrasan Raja was going out hunting, he passed by the gardener's house, and saw a beautiful girl sitting in it. He thought she looked very like his wife, the Fulmati Rani, so he went home to his father and said, Father, I should like to be married to the girl who lives in our gardener's house. All right, said the father, you can be married at once. So they were married the next day. One night the shoemaker's wife took a ram, killed it, and put some of its blood on the Fulmati Rani's mouth while the Rani slept. The next morning she went to the Indrasan Raja and said, Whom have you married? You have married a Rakshas. Just see, she has been eating cows and sheep and chickens. Just come and see. The Raja went, and when he saw the blood on his wife's mouth, he was frightened, and he thought she was really a Rakshas. The shoemaker's wife said to him, If you do not cut this woman in pieces, some harm will happen to you. So the Raja took a knife and cut his beautiful wife into pieces. He then went away very sorrowfully. The Fulmati Rani's arms and legs grew into four houses. Her chest became a tank, and her head a house in the middle of the tank. Her eyes turned into two little doves, and these five houses, the tank, and the doves were transported to the jungle. No one knew this, 
the little doves lived in the house that stood in the middle of the tank the other four houses stood round the tank one day when the indrasan raja was hunting by himself in the jungle he was very tired and he saw the house in the tank so he said i will go into the house to rest a little while and tomorrow i will return home to my father so tying his horse outside he went into the house and lay down to sleep by and by the two little birds came and perched on the roof above his head they began to talk and the raja listened the little husband dove said to his wife this is the man who cut his wife to pieces and then he told her how the indrasan raja had married the beautiful fulmati rani who weighed only one flower and how the shoemaker's wife had drowned her how god had brought her to life again how the shoemaker's wife had burned her and last of all how the raja himself had cut her to pieces and cannot the raja find her again said the little wife dove oh yes he can said her husband but he does not know how to do so but do tell me how he can find her said the little wife dove well said her husband every night at twelve o'clock the rani and her servants come to bathe in the tank her servants wear yellow dresses but she wears a red one now if the raja could get all their dresses every one when they lay them down and go into the tank to bathe and throw away all the yellow dresses one by one keeping only the red one he would recover his wife the raja heard all these things and at midnight the rani and her servants came to bathe the raja lay very quiet and after they had all taken off their dresses and gone into the tank he jumped up and seized every one of the dresses he did not leave one of them and ran away as hard as he could then each of the servants who were only fairies screamed out give me my dress what are you doing why do you take it away then the raja dropped one by one the yellow dresses and kept the red one the fairy servants picked up the dresses and forsook the fulmati rani and ran away the raja came back to her with her dress in his hand and she said oh give me back my dress if you keep it i shall die three times has god brought me to life but he will bring me to life no more the raja fell at her feet and begged her pardon and they were reconciled and he gave her back her dress then they went home and indrasan raja had the shoemaker's wife cut to pieces and buried in the jungle and they lived happily ever after End of Fumati Rani or the Flower Lady by Anonymous Read by Noel Badrian The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter Read by Nathan John This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org once upon a time there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank, underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down a lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there. He was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Now run along, and don't get into mischief. I am going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella, and went through the wood to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First he ate some lettuces and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes, and then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. McGregor? Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting out young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop, thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, 
for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages, and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster, so that I think he might have got away altogether if he had not unfortunately run into a gooseberry net and got caught by the large button on his jacket. It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows who flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop on top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him, and rushed into the tool shed, and jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in, if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower pot. He began to turn them over carefully, looking under each. Presently Peter sneezed. Kachoo! Mr. McGregor was after him in no time, and tried to put his foot upon Peter, who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter. He went back to his work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright, and he had not the least idea which way to go. Also, he was very damp with sitting in that can. After a time, he began to wander about, going lippity, lippity, not very fast and looking all round. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked, and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out, over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family, in the wood. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently, he came to a pond where Mr. McGregor filled his water cans. A white cat was staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still, but now and then the tip of her tail twitched as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scr rich, scratch, scratch, scritch. Peter scattered underneath the bushes, but presently, as nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow and started running as fast as he could go along a straight walk behind some blackcurrant bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner, but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him till he got back home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea, and she gave a dose of it to Peter. One tablespoonful to be taken at bedtime. But Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. The End End of The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter Stories of Don Quixote by James Baldwin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. Getting Ready for Adventures Many years ago, there lived in Spain a very old-fashioned gentleman whom you would have been glad to know. This gentleman had so many odd ways and did so many strange things that he not only amused his neighbours and distressed his friends, but made himself famous throughout the world. What his real name was, no one outside of his village seemed to know. Some said it was this, some said it was that, but his neighbours called him the good Mr. Quijuana, and no doubt this was correct. He was gentle and kind and very brave, and all who knew him loved him. He had neither wife nor child. 
He lived with his niece in his own farmhouse close by a quiet little village in the province of La Mancha. His niece was not yet twenty years of age, so the house was kept and managed by an old servant woman who was more wrinkled than wise and more talkative than handsome. A poor man who lived in a cottage nearby was employed to do the work on the farm, and he did so well that the master had much leisure time and was troubled but little with the cares of business. Mr. Kijuana was rather odd in his appearance and dress, as all old-fashioned gentlemen are apt to be. He was more than fifty years of age, and quite tall and slender. His face was thin, his nose was long, his hair was turning grey. He dressed very plainly. On weekdays he wore a coarse blouse and blue trousers of homespun stuff. On Sundays, however, he put on a plush coat and short velvet breeches and soft slippers with silver buckles. In the hallway of his old-fashioned house, a short, rusty sword was always hanging, and leaning against the wall were a rusty lens and a big rawhide shield. These weapons had belonged to his great-grandfather long ago, when men knew but little about guns and gunpowder. On the kitchen doorstep, an old greyhound was always lying. This dog was very lean and slender, and his hunting days had long been past. But all old-fashioned gentlemen kept greyhounds in those days. In the barn, there was a horse as old and as lean as the greyhound. But of this horse, I will tell you much more in the course of my story. Like many other gentlemen, Mr. Kujana did not work much. He spent almost all his time in reading, reading, reading. He was seldom seen without a book in his hand. When the weather was fine, he would sit in his little library, or under the apple trees in his garden, and read all day. He often forgot to come to his meals. He was so wrapped up in his books that he forgot his horse, his dog, and even his knees. He forgot his friends. He forgot himself. Sometimes he sat up and read all night. Now, what kind of books do you suppose he read? He read no histories, no books of travel. He cared nothing for poetry or philosophy. His whole mind was given to stories. Stories of knights and their daring deeds. He read so many of these stories that he could not think of anything else. His head was full of knights and knightly deeds, of magic and witchcraft, of tournaments and battlefields. If he had read less, he would have been wiser, for much reading does not always improve the mind. At length, it, this old-fashioned gentleman said to himself, Why should I always be a plain farmer and sit here at home? Why may I not become a famous knight? The more he thought about this matter, the more he wished to be a hero like those of whom he had read in his books. Yes, I will be a knight, he said to himself. My mind is fully made up. I will arm myself in a coat of mail. I will mount my noble steed. I will ride out into the world to seek adventures. No danger shall affright me. With my strong arm I will go forth to protect the weak and to befriend the friendless. Yes. I will be a knight, and I will fight against error wherever I find it. So he began at once to get ready for his great undertaking. The first thing to be done was to find some suitable armor, for what knight ever rode out into the world without being encased in steel? In the garret of his home there was an old coat of mail. It had lain there among the dust and cobwebs for a hundred years and more. It was rusted and battered, and some of the parts were missing. It was a poor piece of work at the very best. But he cleaned it as well as he could, and polished it with great care. He cut some pieces of a pasteboard to supply the missing parts, and painted them to look like steel. When they were properly fitted, they answered very well, especially when no fighting was to be done. With a coat of mail, there was an old brass helmet. It, too, was broken, and the straps for holding it on were lost. But Mr. Kijuana patched it up and found some green ribbons, which served instead of straps. 
As he held it up and looked at it from every side, he felt very proud to think that his head would be adorned with so rare a piece of workmanship. And now a state must be provided, for every knight must needs have a noble horse. The poor old creature in the barn was gaunt and thin and very bony, but he was just the stuff for a war horse, wiry and very stubborn. As the old-fashioned gentleman looked at him, he fancied that no steed had ever been so beautiful or so swift. He will carry me most gallantly, he said, and I shall be proud of him. But what shall I call him? A horse that is written by a noble knight must needs have an honourable and high-sounding name. So he spent four days in studying what he should call his steed. At last he said, I have it. His name shall be Rosinante. And why do you give him that strange name? asked the niece. I will tell you, he answered. The word Rosin means common horse. And the word Ante is good Latin for before or formerly. Now, if I call my gallant steed formerly a common horse, the meaning is plain. For everybody will understand that he is now no longer common, but very uncommon, do you see? So his name shall be Rosinante. Then he patted the horse lovingly and gently repeated, Rosinante, Rosinante. He thought that if he could only find as good a name for himself, he would feel like riding out and beginning his adventures at once. For what more could he need? Every knight, he said, has the right to put Don at the beginning of his name, for that is a title of honor and respect. Now, I shall call myself Don, Don, Don something, but what shall it be? He studied his question for eight days. Then a happy thought came into his mind. I will call myself Don Quixote, he cried. And since my home is in the district of La Mancha, I shall be known throughout the world as Don Quixote de La Mancha. What name is more noble than that? What title can be more honorable? The name was indeed not very different from his real name. For have we not said that his neighbors called him Quijuana? The good old gentleman had now mended and polished his armor and found new names for himself and his seat. He felt himself well equipped for adventures. But suddenly the thought came to him that still another thing must be settled before he could ride out and do battle as a real and true knight. In all the stories he had read, every hero who was worthy of knighthood had claims to some fair lady whom he invoked in time of peril, and to whom he brought the prizes which he had won. It was at her feet that the knight must kneel at the end of every quest. It was from her that he must receive the victor's crown. To him, therefore, a lady friend was as necessary as a steed or a suit of armor. Now Don Quixote was not acquainted with many ladies, but he felt that, as a knight, he must send his thoughts upon someone who would be his guiding star as he went faring through the world. Who should it be? This question troubled him more than any other had done. He sat in his house for two whole weeks and thought of nothing else. How would his niece do? Well, she was very young, and he was her uncle. In all the books in his library, there was no account of a knight kneeling at the feet of his own niece. She was not to be thought of. As for his housekeeper, she was too old and homely. He could never think of doing homage to one in her humble station. At length, he remembered a handsome, red-cheeked maiden who lived in or near the village of Toboso. Her name was Adonta Lorenzo. And many years ago, she had smiled at him as he was passing her on the road. He had not seen her since she had grown up, but she must now be the most charming of womankind. He fancied that no lady in the world was better fitted to receive his knightly homage. 
Adonza Lorenzo it shall be, he cried, rubbing his hands together. But what a name! How would it sound when coupled with that of the valiant Don Quixote de la Mancha? Surely it was too common, and she must have a title more like that of a princess. What should it be? He studied over this for many days, and at last hit upon a name which pleased him much. It shall be Dulcinea, he cried. It shall be Dulcinea del Toboso. No other name is so sweet, so harmonious, so like the lady herself. Thus, after weeks of labor and study, Don Quixote de la Mancha at length felt himself prepared to ride forth into the world to seek adventures. He waited only for a suitable opportunity to put his cherished plans into the execution. End of Stories of Don Quixote, Chapter 1, Getting Ready for Adventures, by James Baldwin, read by Eva. The Horse That Aroused the Town by Lillian M. Gask This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A wise and just monarch was the good King John. His kingdom extended over central Italy and included the famous town of Atri, which in days gone by had been a famous harbour on the shores of the Adriatic. Now the sea had retreated from it, and it lay inland. No longer the crested waves rolled on its borders, or tossed their showers of silver spray to meet the vivid turquoise of the sky. The great desire of good King John was that every man, woman, and child in his dominions should be able to obtain justice without delay be they rich or poor. To this end, since he could not possibly listen to all himself, he hung a bell in one of the city towers, and issued a proclamation to say that when this was rung, a magistrate would immediately proceed to the public square and administer justice in his name. The plan worked admirably. Both rich and poor were satisfied, and since they knew that evildoers would be quickly punished, and wrongs set right, men hesitated to defraud or oppress their neighbours, and the great bell pealed less often as years went on. In the course of time, however, the bell rope wore thin, and some ingenious citizen fastened a wisp of hay to it, that this might serve as a handle. One day in the height of summer, when the deserted square was blazing with sunlight, and most of the citizens were taking their noonday rest, their siesta was disturbed by the violent pealing of the bell. Surely some great injustice has been done, they cried, shaking off their languor and hastening to the square. To their amazement they found it empty of all human beings, save themselves. No angry supplicant appealed for justice, but a poor old horse, lame and half-blind, with bones that nearly broke through his skin, was trying with pathetic eagerness to eat the wisp of hay. In struggling to do this, he had rung the bell, and the judge, summoned so hastily for so slight a cause, was stirred to indignation. To whom does this wretched horse belong? he shouted wrathfully. What business has it here? Sir, he belongs to a rich nobleman who lives in that splendid palace whose tall towers glisten white above the palm grove, said an old man coming forward with a deep bow. Time was that he bore his master to battle, carrying him dauntlessly amid shot and shell, and more than once saving his life by his courage and fleetness. When the horse became old and feeble, he was turned adrift, since his master had no further use for him and now the poor creature picks up what food he can in highways and byways. On hearing this, the judge's face grew dark with anger. Bring his master before me, he thundered, and when the amazed nobleman appeared, he questioned him more sternly than he would have done the meanest peasant. Is it true, he demanded, 
that you left this, your faithful servant, to starve, since he could no longer serve you? It is long since I heard of such gross injustice. Are you not ashamed? The nobleman hung his head in silence. He had no word to say in his own defence, as with scathing contempt the judge rebuked him, adding that in future he would neglect the horse at his peril. For the rest of his life, he said, you shall care for the poor beast as he deserves, so that after his long term of faithful service he may end his days in peace. This decision was greeted with loud applause by the town folk who gathered in the square. Our bell is superior to all others, they said to each other with nods and smiles, for it is the means of gaining justice, not only for men, but for animals too in their time of need. And with shouts of triumph they led the old war-horse back to his stable, knowing that for the future its miserly owner would not dare to begrudge it the comfort to which it was so justly entitled. End of The Horse That Aroused the Town by Lillian M. Gask Read by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland The Elves and the Shoemaker by the Brothers Grimm Adapted by Charles Eliot Norton Read by Verity Kendall This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once a shoemaker who worked very hard and was very honest, but still he could not earn enough to live upon, and at last all he had in the world was gone, except just leather enough to make one pair of shoes. Then he cut them all up ready to make up the next day, meaning to get up early in the morning to work. His conscience was clear and his heart was light amidst all his cares, so he went peaceably to bed left all his cares to heaven, and fell asleep. In the morning, after he had said his prayers, he set himself down to work, when, to his great wonder, there stood the shoes already made upon the table. The good man knew not what to say or think of this strange event. He looked at the workmanship. There was not one false stitch in the whole job, and all was neat and true. The same day a customer came in, and the shoes pleased him so well that he paid a very high price for them, and the poor shoemaker with the money bought leather enough to make two pairs more. In the evening he cut out his work and went to bed early, that he might get up betimes in the morning to begin his work. But he was saved all the trouble, for when he got up in the morning the work was again all finished. Presently in came buyers who paid him handsomely for his goods, so that he bought leather enough for four pairs more. He cut out the work again overnight, and found it finished in the morning as before, and so it went on for some time. What was got ready in the evening was always done by daybreak, and the good man soon became thriving and prosperous. One evening about Christmas time, as he and his wife were sitting over the fire chatting together, he said to her, I should like to sit up tonight, and watch that we may see who it is that comes and does my work for me. So they left the light burning, and hid themselves in the corner of the room behind a curtain that was hung up there, and watched to see what would happen. As soon as it was midnight, there came two naked dwarfs, and they set themselves upon the shoemaker's bench, took up the work that was cut out, and began to ply with their little fingers, stitching and rapping and tapping at such a rate that the shoemaker was all amazement, and could not take his eyes off for a moment. And on they went until the job was quite finished, and the shoes stood ready for use on the table. This was long before daybreak, and then they bustled away as quick as lightning. The day before Christmas, the wife said to the shoemaker, These little elves have made us rich, and we ought to be thankful to them, and do something for them in return. I am quite vexed to see them run about as they do. They have nothing upon their back to keep off the cold. I'll tell you what, I'll make them each a shirt and a waistcoat and a pair of trousers into the bargain. Do you make them each a little pair of shoes? The thought pleased the shoemaker very much, and one evening when all the things were ready, they laid them out on the table instead of the work that they used to cut out, and then they went and hid themselves to watch what the little elves would do. About midnight they came in, and were going to sit down to their work as usual, but when they saw the clothes lying there for them, they were greatly delighted. They dressed themselves in the twinkling of an eye, and danced and capered and sang as merry as could be, till at last they danced out of the door over the green, and the shoemaker saw them no more, but everything went well to him from that time forward as long as he lived. End of The Elves and the Shoemaker
by the Brothers Grimm, adapted by Charles Eliot Norton. The Tale of Timmy Tiptoes by Beatrix Potter, read by Verity Kendall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, there was a little, fat, comfortable grey squirrel called Timmy Tiptoes. He had a nest thatched with leaves in the top of a tall tree, and he had a little squirrel wife called Goody. Timmy Tiptoes sat out, enjoying the breeze. He whisked his tail and chuckled, Little wife Goody, the nuts are almost ripe. We must lay up a store for winter and spring. Goody Tiptoes was busy pushing moss under the thatch. The nest is so snug, we shall be sound asleep all winter. Then we shall wake up all the thinner when there is nothing to eat in springtime, replied prudent Timothy. When Timmy and Goody Tiptoes came to the nut thicket, they found other squirrels were there already. Timothy took off his jacket and tung it on a twig. They worked away quietly by themselves. Every day they made several journeys and picked up quantities of nuts. They carried them away in bags and stored them in several hollow stumps near the tree where they had built their nest. When these stumps were full, they began to empty the bags into a hole high up a tree that had belonged to a woodpecker. The nuts rattled down, down, down inside the tree. "'How shall you ever get them out again? It's like a money-box,' said Goody. "'I shall be much thinner before springtime, my love,' said Timmy Tiptoes, peeping into the hole. They did collect quantities, because they did not lose them. Squirrels who bury their nuts in the ground lose more than half, because they cannot remember the place. The most forgetful squirrel in the wood was called Silvertail. He began to dig, and he could not remember. And then he dug again, and found some nuts that did not belong to him, and there was a fight. And other squirrels began to dig. The whole wood was in commotion. Unfortunately, just at this time, a flock of little birds flew by, from bush to bush, searching for green caterpillars and spiders. There were several sorts of little birds, twittering different songs. Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? And another sang, little bit of bread and no cheese, little bit of bread and no cheese. The squirrels followed and listened. The first little bird flew into the bush where Timmy and Goody Tiptoes were quietly tying up their bags, and it sang, Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? Timmy Tiptoes went on with his work without replying. Indeed, the little bird did not expect an answer. It was only singing its natural song, and it meant nothing at all. But when the other squirrels heard that song, they rushed upon Timmy Tiptoes and cuffed and scratched him and upset his bag of nuts. The innocent little bird, which had caused all the mischief, flew away in fright. Timmy rolled over and over and then turned tail and fled towards his nest, followed by a crowd of squirrels shouting, Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? They caught him and dragged him up the very same tree, where there was a little round hole, and they pushed him in. The hole was much too small for Timmy Tiptoe's figure. They squeezed him dreadfully. It was a wonder they did not break his ribs. We will leave him here till he confesses, said Silvertail Squirrel, and he shouted into the hole, Who's been digging up my nuts? Timmy Tiptoe's made no reply. He had tumbled down inside the tree upon half a peck of nuts belonging to himself. He lay quite stunned and still. Goody Tiptoe's picked up the nut bags and went home. She made a cup of tea for Timmy, but he didn't come, and didn't come. Goody Tiptoes passed a lonely and unhappy night. Next morning she ventured back to the nut bushes to look for him, but the other unkind squirrels drove her away. She wandered all over the wood, calling, Timmy Tiptoes, Timmy Tiptoes, oh, where is Timmy Tiptoes? In the meantime, Timmy Tiptoes came to his senses. He found himself tucked up in a little moss bed, very much in the dark, feeling sore. It seemed to be underground. Timmy coughed and groaned because his ribs hurted him. There was a chirpy noise, and a small striped chipmunk appeared with a night light and hoped he felt better. It was most kind to Timmy Tiptoes. He lent him his night cap, and the house was full of provisions. The chipmunk explained that it had rained nuts through the top of the tree. Besides, I found a few buried. It laughed and chuckled when it heard Timmy's story. While Timmy was confined to bed, it ticed him to eat quantities. But how shall I ever get out through the hole unless I thin myself? My wife will be anxious. Just another nut or two nuts, let me crack them for you, said the chipmunk. Timmy Tiptoes grew fatter and fatter. Now Goody Tiptoes had set to work again by herself. She did not put any more nuts into the woodpecker's hole, because she had always doubted how they could be got out again. She hid them under a tree root. They rattled down, down, down. Once, when Goody emptied an extra big bagful, there was a decided squeak, and next time Goody brought another bagful, a little striped chipmunk grumbled out in a hurry. It is getting perfectly full up downstairs. The sitting room is full, and they are rolling along the passage, and my husband, Chippy Hacky, has run away and left me. What is the explanation of these showers of nuts? I am sure I beg your pardon. I did not know that anyone lived here, said Mrs. Goody Tiptoes. But where is Chippy Hacky? My husband, Timmy Tiptoes, has run away too. I know where Chippy is. A little bird told me, said Mrs. Chippy Hacky. 
she led the way to the woodpecker's tree and they listened at the hole down below there came a noise of nutcrackers and a fat squirrel voice and a thin squirrel voice were singing together my little old man and i fell out how shall we bring this matter out bring it about as well as you can and get you gone you little old man you could squeeze in through that little round hole said goody tiptoes yes i could said the chipmunk but my husband chippy hacky bites down below there came a noise of cracking nuts and nibbling and then the fat squirrel voice and the thin squirrel voice sang for the diddle dum day day diddle dum dee day diddle 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 dum day then goody peeped in at the hole and called out timmy tiptoes oh fee timmy tiptoes and timmy replied is that you goody tiptoes why certainly he came up and kissed goody through the hole but he was so fat that he could not get out chippy hacky was not too fat but he did not want to come he stayed down below and chuckled and so it went on for a fortnight till the big wind blew off the top of the tree and opened up the hole and let in the rain then timmy tiptoes came out and went home with an umbrella but chippy hacky continued to camp out for another week although it was uncomfortable at last a large bear came walking through the woods perhaps he was also looking for nuts he seemed to be sniffing around chippy hacky went home in a hurry and when chippy hacky got home he found that he had caught a cold in his head and he was more uncomfortable still and now timmy and goody tiptoes keep their nut store fastened up with a little padlock and whenever the little bird sees the chipmunks he sings who's been digging up my nuts who's been digging up my nuts but nobody ever answers end of the tale of timmy tiptoes by beatrix potter read by verity kendall The Fairy Who Came to Our House by Carolyn S. Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Who Came to Our House There was once a dear little girl who lived in our house. She was quite loving and sweet and truthful. She would have been a dear, dear little girl, but for one thing, she was a wee bit careless. It was just about little things, you know. Perhaps it might be drying the cups until they shone. Perhaps it might be dusting the undermost places, like the rungs of the chair and the piano legs. Perhaps it might be giving fresh milk to Taffy, the black pussy cat. Perhaps it might be leaving the old rag doll out in the weather all night. The old rag doll had rheumatism, and a night out in the dew made it worse. A dear, dear little girl would have remembered these things, but our dear little girl forgot. One morning she woke very early, but the sun was behind a cloud, and the fog crept into the nursery. She began to forget things before breakfast. Oh, where is my red hair ribbon, she said, and where is my shoestring? After breakfast she wanted to make a little saucer pie with mother in the kitchen. Just as she put it in the oven she thought about her unmade bed upstairs. Before she had half finished the bed, she remembered that Grandmother was waiting to have her spectacles found. Then the doorbell rang, and she just had to run and see who it was. It was such a short way to the end of the garden, she really had to run to the gate and see if next door Helen were at home. Ah, the broken shoestring was in the way. The dear little girl tumbled down in the garden path and bumped her poor little nose. And the saucer pie burned black in the oven. The bed was not made, and Grandmother had no spectacles. As she sat up in the garden path, crying two big tears, whom should she see on the stone beside her? There had been no one there before, but a tiny old woman. I think she was just three inches high, and she wore a long red cloak and a little red hood, and she carried a crooked little cane. Her face was as brown and wrinkled as a last fall's oak leaf. She rapped on the stone with her cane as she said, What are you crying about, little girl? Oh, sobbed the dear little girl, I want to not forget so many things. Run right into the house, said the fairy, for she was a fairy. I am going to help you all day long. The little girl rubbed her eyes. There was no fairy upon the stone, only two wee footprints. So she jumped up and ran into the house. The first thing she spied was a pair of shiny spectacles under the hall rack. Grandmother was so pleased to have them. As the little girl came downstairs, again she heard a squeaky laugh. There was a whisk of a red cloak on the staircase, and someone said, Hurry, hurry, kitchen trouble. Kettle wants to boil and bubble. So the little girl ran down to the kitchen and filled the old copper tea kettle, who sat fussing upon the stove, because he was empty. As she put on the cover, whom should she see standing upon the spout but a little figure in a red cloak? And this is what she heard. 
run and set the plates for lunch. Knives and forks are in a bunch. Yes, the table did need setting. When it was all done, there was the fairy on the sideboard, twirling around like a Japanese top and saying, Dolly sings are such a sight. Put the bureau drawers to right. So the little girl flew upstairs to the nursery. She packed the doll's dresses in the trunk. She folded all the hair ribbons in the top drawer, and there was a lost red one at the very bottom. All day long the fairy kept reminding her of things to do. After lunch there she was sitting on the edge of Mother's darning basket, looking like a red Dutch cheese, and saying, Holes to be mended, and darning begun. Find Mother's needles and pins, every one. Toward evening there she was on the arm of Father's easy chair, saying, father is coming now quick as can be lay out his slippers and book before tea the little girl was very tired by bedtime but it had been a busy happy day she sat in her little chair by the nursery fire and rocked and wondered if it could all have been a dream when pop there was the little old woman in the red cloak dancing upon a red coal and saying look in the box on the bureau my dear and try to remember as long as a year so the dear little girl looked in the box on the bureau, and there, inside, was a little gold wishing ring, and it said on the bow, From all the family in our house, for a dear, dear little girl who tries to remember. And the queer little fairy never came again, but that was because she did not need to. End of The Fairy Who Came to Our House by Carolyn S. Bailey Read by Ginger Cucolo. The Stone Baby by Carolyn S. Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Baby. The Stone Baby was lonesome. He had looked forth over the city from his little round window on the side of the great building where the architect said he must forever stay, and had seen the homes of the other little ones. Then he said to himself, When it was summer I could see the children at their windows and in the street, but now they keep well inside. From here I cannot see the big boys and the girls skate and coast even. I'd like to see the green grass in the square and the boys sailing boats on the pond. Dear me, I believe it's snowing. I don't mind a cold nose and snow-powdered hair, but I can't see even the children's houses if it gets very thick. Just then there was a chirp chirp in the air, and something flew right under the stone baby's chin. It was a little sparrow coming for refuge from the storm. Chirp chirp, and another came, and another. Thank you, baby, for a little corner from the storm, said the sparrows. Oh, you're very welcome, said the stone child. They nestle closer and closer. Isn't it pleasant to be of some use in the world, said the stone baby, for stone babies are so much more serious than flesh and blood children, and they wouldn't do this for a real walking and running child. End of the Stone Baby by Carolyn S. Bailey Recording by Ginger Cucolope